We're at the Dhammasukha Meditation Center with Bhante Vilmo Ramsey, and today is August 17, 2013. And tonight we will be doing the Majima Nikaya number 111, one by one as they occurred, the Anupada Sutta. <coughs> This is my favorite sutta, so you get to hear it a lot. We probably have 30 or 40 copies of it. <laughs> Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was at living at Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anath and Bendika's Park. There he addressed the monks thus. Monks, venerable sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this. Monks, Sariputta is wise. Sariputta has great wisdom. Sariputta has wide wisdom. Sariputta was the first chief disciple. He was second to the Buddha in wisdom. Moggallana was the second chief disciple. He was second to Buddha in psychic abilities. Sariputta has joyous wisdom. Sariputta has quick wisdom. Sariputta has keen wisdom. Sariputta has penetrative wisdom. During half a month, monks, Sariputta gained insight into states one by one as they occurred. Now, Sariputta's insights into states one by one as they occurred was this. Here monks, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, <coughs> secluded from unwholesome states, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And the states in the first jhana, the thinking, the examining thought, the joy, the happiness, the unification of mind. Now the next part is the five aggregates, which means that it's the same as the four foundations of mindfulness, like I was talking about yesterday. The contact, feeling, perception, formations, and mind. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus. So indeed these states not having been come into being, having been they vanished. Regarding those states he abided <coughs> unattracted, he didn't try to hold on to any of the states. Unrepelled, he didn't try to push away any. Independent, he saw the impersonal nature. Detached, free, dissociated, all talking about the impersonal nature. With a mind rid of barriers, when you're, when you're in the first jhana and you your mindfulness is strong, you don't have any hindrances arising. That's what it's talking about. He understood there's an escape beyond this, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. So the, uh, the enthusiasm you start seeing that it actually works and you start getting a little, yeah, this is good. The decision is 
the, your decision right now is to recognize and use the six R's. Or get caught in your, your hindrance and stay with that and suffer some. Your decision. Energy. Remember I was telling you about how you have to balance your energy. Mindfulness. Equanimity. Equanimity and attention. These are, this is the only place in the suttas I've ever found that mentions all of these different things about the first jhana. The balance of mind is starting to develop when you get into the first jhana. And what you keep your attention on that is the inclination of your mind. So it just takes a little while to get used to it. <coughs> Again, monks, with the stilling of thinking and examining thought, Sariputta entered and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and stillness of mind without thinking and examining thought, with joy and happiness born of collectedness. When you get into the second jhana, the feeling of joy is stronger. And you actually feel like you're floating. I've had some students that they told me, I was sitting and I, sh I was sure that my head was going to hit the ceiling, so I had to look. And I've already told you that floating can happen. Not very often, but it can happen. And the states in the second jhana. Oh, when you get into the second jhana, if you start to verbalize the wish, you start to feel tightness in your head. So this is where you let go of the verbalization. The self-confidence. When you get into the second jhana, actually you start feeling like you're starting to get it. You feel like, yeah, this is right. This is a good path. The joy, the happiness, the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formations, and mind. Again, in every one of these jhanas, you're going to have the foundations of mindfulness until we get to the last, last part. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood that there's still more to do, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Again, monks, with the fading away of joy, Sariputta abided in equanimity, mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body he entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble ones announce he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful and the states in the third jhana, <coughs> the equanimity, the pleasure, the mindfulness, the full awareness and unification of mind, the contact, <coughs> the contact, feeling, perception, formations and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. 
he understood there's still more to do and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is. When you get in the third jhana, joy doesn't come up anymore. But you feel very comfortable in your mind and in your body. As <coughs> you start letting go of tightness in your mind, you, s you also stop feeling different parts of your body. Your hands will, they'll be there. If you put your attention on them, you'll, you'll feel them. But when you have your mind on your object of meditation, you don't feel it. And before long, there's other places in your body that are just going to disappear. And eventually, that feeling of loving kindness will come up into your head. Don't push it back down. This is a natural process. This is the way it's supposed to happen. Let go of the want to control things. You will hear sounds. You will, your mind won't, won't shake and get distracted just because it's a sound. <coughs> but if I were to come up to you and say something, you would hear me, you would understand what I said and react accordingly. Okay. Again, monks, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. And the states in the fourth jhana, <coughs> the equanimity, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling, the mental unconcern due to tranquility, the purity of mindfulness and unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formations and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. <coughs> These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood thus, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there's still more to do. When you get into the fourth jhana, you just, you're not paying attention to your body at all. You will feel your head. I've had some students tell me they felt like their head was sitting on the floor. You have very, very strong balance in your mind. When you get to the fourth jhana, that's when I will tell you, you have become an advanced meditator. And I will give you a different meditation to work, work with for a little while. And then when you get done with that, that part, I will tell you of another meditation I want you to do. <clears throat> Maybe I should make up some diplomas, do you think? <laughs> Again, monks, <clears throat> with the complete surmounting of gross 
perceptions of form. Now that because you still have contact, if you something touches you, you will feel it. It doesn't make your mind shake, but you'll feel it. <coughs> Otherwise, you won't feel your body. With the disappearance of gross perceptions of sensory impact, aware that space is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite space. When you get to this, this is where the feeling of loving kindness is too coarse and it changes to a feeling of compassion. You have to be able to d tell me what it's like. And along with that change of into compassion, you start to feel the expansion in all directions at the same time. And there's no stopping, it's just expansion. That's all that happens. There's no you in the middle of it. It's just the feeling of, of expansion. <coughs> and the states in the base of infinite space, the perception of the base of infinite space and the unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formations, and mind. So we still have the four foundations of mindfulness. The enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood there's still more to do, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is still more to go. So you, you know that you're progressing. Sometimes people will progress so fast doing this, it's just remarkable. I had a student in Indonesia. She'd never done any meditation before. She was about 50 or 55 years old. She was a Catholic. She didn't believe in Buddhism. <coughs> but she said, something tells me I should take a meditation retreat with you, so I'm doing that. She got into the Arupa Jhanas, and it was right after lunch until the time for the Dhamma talk. She came up to me and she said, this was my experience, and she <coughs> described each one of the Arupa jhanas. Now what am I supposed to do? Because I wanted to smack her in the back of the head. Nobody's supposed to go that fast and do it that well. And her face became so radiant, it was just remarkable. Just really good. <coughs> now, that was the arising and passing away of dependent origination maybe a hundred thousand times. Okay? Again, by completely surmounting the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of infinite consciousness. So, your mind becomes so still. Now this is when you start sitting for half an hour, 45 minutes without having anything distract you. And your mind becomes so still and your, uh, your attention becomes so sharp that you will start to see individual consciousnesses arise and pass away. That means one set of dependent origination. <coughs> 
And this can happen at any of the sense doors. I have, I've had some students that were musicians and it happened in their ear. And what it is, is a rising and passing away of consciousnesses very quickly. But it's like it's going a little bit too slow. And there's a break in between each one of those. The feeling of compassion changes to a feeling of joy. This is a calm kind of joy. It is a happy feeling, but it doesn't have the excitement in it. And this is when I was telling you, your eyes can pop open sometimes. Doesn't matter whether they're open or closed. <coughs> now, with all of these different jhanas that I'm talking about right now, you can keep your stay with your object of meditation when you get up and you go out and walk and stay with your object of meditation and you can stay with it when you're taking a shower or doing other things and you'll start to notice the flickering and this can happen at any one of the sense doors I don't talk much about the nose because there's not much to smell around here. There's no food, that sort of thing, or taste. But it can be with the body, and it can be with mind. Seeing individual arise and pass away of consciousnesses. And it does it all the time. <clears throat> and the states in the base of infinite consciousness, the perception of the base of infinite consciousness and unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formations, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention, these states were defined by me one by one as the, by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. So you're seeing impermanence. Now the thing with this particular state is that you, you see very, very clearly that everything is impermanent because you're just seeing individual consciousnesses come up and go away. And there's a disturbance in that. And that's a form of suffering. And the big lesson for this particular uh, state is that you got no control over it. It just happens by itself. There's nobody home. There is no controller. <clears throat> so it's real interesting, this particular uh, part of the meditation. And then we get to the next stage, which is probably the most interesting part of the meditation. Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of infinite consciousness, aware that there is nothing, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of nothingness. When you get to this state, the feeling of joy changes to very strong equanimity. Very strong. Now, mind is not looking outside of itself anymore. And you, I've had some, some uh, students tell me that I feel like a fool. I'm sitting there and there's nothing. But there are subtle things that do arise. You still have the... Uh, 
the seven awakening factors. There's so there's still some adjustments. Now your mind is getting so sharp and so clear that you're you're taking when let me start over again. When you get into the fourth jhana, you're using loving kindness as your object of meditation. When you get into infinite con or infinite space, you're using compassion as your object of meditation. When you get into infinite consciousness, you're using joy as your object of meditation. When you get into nothingness, you're using equanimity as your object of meditation. Now, this is like being on a tightrope that's really, really tiny, like a, a spider web. And if you have a little bit too much energy, you'll start to get a little restless. Not quite enough, you'll start to get dull, not sleepy anymore. <coughs> So this is where you learn to adjust the amount of energy you're using to stay with your uh, equanimity. And you learn to adjust little tiny bits, just little bit, and see how that, if you need a little bit more, then do a little bit more. but. This teaches you how to really stay on your object of meditation. Now you can stay for 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. You will start sitting longer. A couple hours is pretty, pretty regular for this state. And the states in the base of nothingness, the perception of the base of nothingness and unification of mind, the contact, feeling, perception, formation, and mind, the enthusiasm, decision, energy, mindfulness, equanimity, and attention. These states were defined by him one by one as they occurred. Known to him those states arose, known they were present, known they disappeared. He understood there's still more to do, and with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is. Now, your mind is on your object of meditation, and you'll be able to see the wobble. When you start seeing your mind wobble a little bit, you six are right then, and you'll just stay on your object of meditation. But there's something else that happens right before the wobble, and you have to tell me what it is. <laughs> Gets really interesting. And you have such, such a nice state of balance. I mean, you just don't, ah, this is good stuff. <coughs> Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of nothingness, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Now, when you get into this state, this is really something. Your mind becomes very still. And... At first, what happens is you feel like you're asleep and aware at the same time. And this will happen for five, ten minutes, something, not very long. When you come out of that state, then you start remembering what happened while you were in that state. You'll see colors patterns, shapes, things like that. Right after you, you six are each one of those things that you saw. And then 
you get into what I call the exquisite quietness. I mean, your mind is just still. Now, when you start meditating, your mind flip-flops. And as you go deeper, then it doesn't move quite as much. When you get to the fourth jhana, it's more like a vibration. And as you go deeper and deeper, that vibration gets to be less and less and less. <clears throat> when you get into this state of neither perception nor non-perception, you'll be able to sit for long periods of time without having anything arise. Your mind is so still. Now, some of the problems I've had with some of my students for three or four years, they wanted some excitement, so they'd say, well, I'm sitting and nothing's happening. I'm going to get up and move around. Don't do that. Sit there. From, it's like from a long distance away, you'll see mine start to vibrate a little bit. And as soon as you see that, you relax. And then you'll be able to sit for another long period of time. When you were in infinite consciousness, you were seeing individual consciousnesses. Now you're going to see the individual links. And each link, let's say you start at, oh, feeling. Okay, feeling starts to come up, that little bitty vibration. And you six are. And then contact, and it's about half as big as feeling. And then you'll see the uh, mentality, materiality. And that's about half as big as the contact was. And then you'll see consciousness. And again, that's about half as big. So we're talking about being very, very subtle. So you have to be able to sit for a while before it comes up. Don't be, <coughs> don't be too curious about it. Just relax. Relax into it. Relax, relax. When you get into this state, it's hard to tell if there's any vibration at all. And when it does come up, it's very subtle. But you have to be able to get used to being in this state without any disturbance before you'll be able to see little vibrations. Eventually, you'll get to a state where there's <clears throat> nothing else that occurs. And then you will experience what is called the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. That means there is no more perception, no more feeling, no more consciousness. You'll be in that state for period of time when you come out of that state it's like you have a clean blackboard there's nothing on it then you will see the links of dependent origination and how they arise and you will also see how they cease now, this is from your own direct knowledge. So this is a really a big, oh, wow. And then <coughs> you experience Nibbana. When you get out of that state, you will feel a sense of relief that you didn't know was possible. And you experience very, very strong joy. The joy lasts for, oh, three, four, five days. It's 
really nice. And the feeling of relief, you'll feel like there's there's something that changed in my perspective. And what's changed now is that you will never again have any doubt as to whether that's the right path or not. In Asia, a lot of people that are Buddhists, they just do uh, their chanting and that sort of thing as some kind of a rite and ritual. You know for a fact that that is not going to lead you to Nibbana. <coughs> and you see that things are pretty much impersonal. And you saw it because of the work that you're doing. And this is one of the reasons why I chose the Buddha's path, because the only thing you have to believe in Buddhism is that everything happens one thing at a time. When, you're, when you see, you're not hearing. When you hear, you're not seeing. It happens fast real fast and at first you kind of have to blind faith it but after a while you see for yourself this is really true Sariputta emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he, he observed the states that had passed, ceased and changed. That's the little colors and that sort of thing. So indeed, these states, not having been come into being, having been, they vanished. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. So he knew that everything is impersonal. There's nothing worth holding on to. There's nothing worth pushing away. Everything that arises is an impersonal process. He understood there is an escape beyond this and with the cultivation of that attainment he confirmed that there is. Again, monks, by completely surmounting the base of neither perception nor non-perception, Sariputta entered upon and abided in the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And his distractions were destroyed by his seeing with wisdom. In other words, he had the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And then he, now this is, it's really small and very subtle, little. And he saw the links of dependent origination. It's such a profound experience that it does change you. Your personality becomes softer. You don't have any more interest in trying somebody else's path because you know this is it. This, this really works. So you don't have any more doubt and you have seen that everything is impersonal. Now, I can't tell you what stage you're going to be when it happens. I don't predict the future. I don't know what's going to happen next. Here, Sariputta was already a Sotapanna. He was at the first stage of awakening. Both he and Moggallana they were incredibly intelligent beings because they just heard one verse and 
they understood it. And the verse was about how dependent origination works. <coughs> now, Sariputta, he was doing a lot of meditation and it took him two whole weeks to attain arahatship. Moggallana, it only took one week. The reason it took him such a long time, <coughs> a long time, <laughs> uh, is he had a curiosity about dependent origination and he really wanted to understand all of the different links and how they work. And that curiosity, that one little tiny desire, was the thing that stopped him from having it happen faster. Now I'll give you another sutta soon about the uh, distractions. And one of the distractions is longing. I really want to attain Nibbana. I wonder when it's going to happen. Oh, man, I've been doing this so long. Holding on to that one little desire will stop you from attaining Nibbana, even though you're ready to attain it. Now, what's, what's a lot of students, what happens with them is after they have had this attainment, they come and they tell me, you know, I didn't care whether it happened or not. I I just, it's going to happen when it's going to happen. I don't care when it is. That's the mindset that they had to have. So there's no longing in there. But Sariputta had that one little curiosity and he wanted to keep going with it. And one day the Buddha was giving a Dhamma talk to some people that came and Sariputta was fanning him. And as he listened to the Buddha give the Dhamma talk, he realized that the Buddha wasn't even attached to the Dhamma. And he saw that he was. And he let go of that attachment and became an arahat while he was fanning the Buddha. He emerged mindful from that attainment. Having done so, he recalled the states that had passed, ceased, and changed. So indeed, these states, not having been, come into being, having been, they vanish. Regarding those states, he abided unattracted, unrepelled, independent, detached, free, dissociated, with a mind rid of barriers. He understood there's no escape beyond this. And with the cultivation of that attainment, he confirmed that there is not. Monks, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he has attained mastery and perfection in noble virtue. Mastery and perfection in noble collectedness attain mastery and perfection in noble wisdom, attain mastery in, and perfection in noble deliverance. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Monks, rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, he is a son of the Blessed One, born of his breast, born of his mouth, born of the Dhamma, created by the Dhamma, an heir in the Dhamma, not an heir in material things. It is of Sariputta indeed that rightly speaking this should be said. Monks, the matchless wheel of Dhamma set rolling by the Tathagata is kept rolling rightly by Sariputta. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. 
Now you know it's why it's my favorite sutta. <laughs> There's a lot of information in that. <coughs> and the thing that's real interesting is that in each one of the jhanas, up until nothingness, you have the four foundations of mindfulness. In neither perception nor non-perception, your mind is so subtle that all you're seeing is just little tiny vibrations so that your mindfulness is very sharp at that time. So that's how you do it. <laughs> huh? <laughs> so you still got a few days left. Can happen. The thing is, you don't know when it's going to happen. Now, if you keep your meditation going every day, at first, when you get off retreat, your meditation is going to not be as good because you're doing it a lot here. But if you sit for two hours a day, you will get up to this level that you that you left here with and you will progress more and more. It can happen to you at any time. Or it can happen for you at any time, I guess. It just depends. Now when you attain Nibbana, or when you attain a jhana, you have the potential to attain Nibbana in this lifetime. So it's a real interesting thing. It can happen it, coming out of any one of the jhanas. It can happen. It just depends on the individual. It is the the more the more interest you have in doing it, the more fun you have doing it, the faster your progress becomes. Now the thing that you also want to remember is that meditation is not just about sitting. The meditation is all of the time. You, you do your sitting meditation because that's when you have the least amount of disturbances. But the more you smile, the more joy you have in your, in your everyday life, the easier it is to recognize when a hindrance starts to come up, the easier it is to let it go the more balance you have in your mind. And that balance translates into balance in your city. There's two stages to every step. There's the sotapanna with the path knowledge. That's your first experience. And when, when that happens for you and you come and tell, talk to me about it, I'm going to tell you right then and there, go back and sit. You're not going to feel like going back and sitting, but you need to. You continue on until you get the fruition, which is another experience like this, very similar. So you have the, no, the sotapanna with path knowledge and sotapanna with path and fruition. When you get the fruition, the everything is very much set for you, for you, and you will not uh, ha ever have any doubt, and you will see the impersonal nature of everything. As you continue on, You start your meditation by getting into nothingness. 
and you're using equanimity as your object of meditation and then that will fade away and then you'll get into this uh, exquisite quiet and you'll be able to sit in that for a couple hours three hours four hours when you sit longer I want you to walk more okay get your blood going especially if you sit for three or four hours I want you to walk fast enough that you actually have to breathe through your mouth and that helps your, your whole circulation and that will help your sitting <coughs> that lady I was telling you about this happened on the fourth day of her retreat that she became a Sotapanna by the end of the 10 day retreat she had become a Sakadagami with fruition <laughs> so it is possible in this lifetime I promise so it's some real interesting things that you're going to be going through and as you go deeper it gets more and more interesting the subtle little insights I mean you start looking at other people and you start seeing oh this is how dependent origination is rising for her or him oh there's the attachment right there we see that and you'll start even seeing it in animals uh, you, you, the dogs you can see that their dependent origination arising all, all the way especially Rex <laughs> but you'll have different little insights about oh I'm attached there I don't need that and you start getting more and more balance as you go deeper and deeper in the meditation and it leads to a lot of contentment definitely worthwhile any question you have a feeling arise pleasant painful neither painful nor pleasant then craving arises happens fast then your opinions thoughts ideas story and this is where you really grab on to this is my opinion and then the emotional habitual tendencies and almost always that arises because you're trying to think the feeling so when you six are right then then you won't have the rest of it but if you if you get caught and you don't remember then you're going to have the birth of action and right after that suffering and you'll be stuck in the suffering for as long as you you are and then you use the six R's and you say well but the suffering doesn't go away so it's just a feeling is it your feeling who wants that feeling who doesn't want that feeling who wants to control it see the six R's are not to control anything the six R's are to help you observe how the process works okay you'll get more I promise you get more about dependent origination as a matter of fact I was thinking about it for tomorrow hmm you're mentioning that um, one thing one has to 
brief Buddhism is that uh, everything happens one thing at a time. Right. So with the different consciousnesses arising and passing, they're coming through all, all the six sense based. Right, but they don't come through at the same time. Then you're not going to have you're not going to have things happen. You're not going to have. I mean, well, I was thinking possibly there could be simultaneous things happening in two different senses. It's it's not a continuous thing. I mean, when you look at something, you think it's one consciousness that's just looking. But when you get to infinite consciousness, you're seeing that it's bunches of little tiny ones. It's not one thing. It's a bunch of consciousnesses arising and passing away. And it happens so fast. I mean, that's a hundred thousand. It happens so fast that you think that you're seeing and hearing at the same time. But when you get into infinite consciousness, then you start to see, well, that's a little bit different than what you thought. And you really do see the impermanence of everything. And because it's there, it is a kind of disturbance. And when you get into uh, neither perception nor non-perception, you'll sit for a long period of time without any disturbance and you'll see one of the links starting to come up and you, you relax right then. And then you'll sit for a long period of time. No disturbance at all. There's a lot of relief in that. And <coughs> the whole thing with going from one jhana to the next jhana to the next jhana is that you're purifying your mind more and more and more. So when you get to neither perception nor non-perception, and you sit without anything disturbing your mind, you are making so much merit, it's just unbelievable. Now, that thing that's in the, in the window in the dining hall, the little chart with all of those, that's what I'm showing you. And because of that relaxed step, people that practice absorption concentration, it could take them years, literal years, to get to neither perception nor non-perception. I have students that get there in 10 days. As a result, these people that are practicing one-pointed concentration, they think that's impossible. There's no way. You don't know what you're talking about. I've had that conversation a lot of times, and I pulled out this particular sutta, and I say, this is how it happens. And they have this idea that when you get to the fourth jhana, you don't breathe anymore. You don't need to breathe. You breathe through your ears, through your skin. And you absolutely don't have any body at all. And if somebody comes up and they poke you with a stick, you won't feel it. Come along, take a gun right beside their ear. Bang! They wouldn't hear it. And they think that's the way it's supposed to be. But where's the awareness? You know, the full awareness and mindfulness. Where is that? Well, I'm on my object to meditation. That's all. The object to meditation doesn't have much information in it. But you can, with this particular meditation, one of the reasons that I don't make it a big deal that you get into jhana is because the people that practice absorption, they start puffing their chest up a little bit. You know, I'm hot stuff. I got into this jhana or that jhana. 
And that's why I call it a level of your understanding. As you go deeper into this, you start seeing how everything works. And it's real important that you understand how it works. And as you go deeper, this next level, yeah, oh wow, look at that. It's real good. This meditation, I try to make sure that you don't have so much pride. Just because you're in that jhana. I mean, there was one lady in, in South Korea that she, after the second or third day of the retreat, I started asking her what she's doing because she wasn't following directions very well. And she told me in no uncertain terms, I have the fourth jhana. And I said, so? If you don't follow the directions, you're not going to learn this. Eventually, she finally did get to the fourth jhana. But it was a lot of work getting her there. She just had the absorption concentration and the pride of being able to get into this deep state. But she didn't have very strong mindfulness. When people practice any kind of one-pointed concentration, if they hear a sound, it boinks them. Oh, jeez, he slammed the door. Or he walked beside me. Or somebody said something. And it's like, when you get boinked like that, it's because your concentration and your mindfulness are not in balance. Concentration too deep, mindfulness too shallow. But with this meditation, doesn't matter. It's just a sound. So what? Dogs barking. Okay. There's a motorcycle out there revving up. Okay. So what? It's just a sound. It's not my sound. I didn't ask it to come up. I can't make it go away. So why should I even bother with it? So this meditation is a little bit different than 95, 98% of what's being taught in the world today. I just got through listening to a guy that is uh, studying uh, people with psychic abilities. And he has all of these machines that they can actually tell now when someone that might claim that they can talk to other beings that have died. And they say, yeah, I can do that. Well, he hooks them up to this machine and he knows where to look to see whether their, their uh, attention has changed anyway. And when he sees they've changed, they, they're in an altered state. So, yeah, I believe you, you can do that. So, uh, you can do that kind of thing with one-pointed concentration. That's why I was telling you about Drew. He was doing it with this kind of meditation and seeing the differences. Just in the heart pattern, there was a, a striking difference. You'll get to meet him tomorrow. That's real interesting about Drew because he practiced with me for two years before I ever met him. He would just do the online retreat and he was doing great. He was really serious about it and he, yeah, it was quite remarkable. 
he got into the Arupa jhanas and I'd never met him before. <laughs> so, anything else? Yeah, I can depend on it. Balance. Yeah. It's a very, very strong balance. Is that similar to energy? No. Mm -hmm. The energy is what you use to get and keep that balance. And you're starting to experience some of it now. Both of you are. It gets stronger as time goes by. It's quite nice. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> Let's share some merit then. May suffering ones be suffering free, and the fear struck fearless be. May we shed all grief, and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty powers, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. <laughs>